Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 to 9. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before his shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. Hmm. What significant words as we sit in this Good Friday. Good morning, friends. It's good to be together. And today, for the next 10 minutes or so, I just want to invite us into Good Friday to sit with those words that we've just heard, the words that just paint such a profound picture of the depth of suffering that Jesus endured and the reality that he actually journeyed all of that alone. And on this Good Friday, I also just want us to invite to sit in the reality of those accounts of Jesus' death as we reflect on them, as we sit with some of the words of the passages that we've already been hearing, but not just for the sake of uh, remembering and looking back, although that's a significant part, but also to sit in the reality of the significance that holds for us today. Because when Jesus, in Jesus' death and ultimate resurrection of the cross, that actually changed the trajectory of history forever. And so on this day, on this Good Friday, there is significance for us to and I want to invite all of us into that. As we continue, I would want to take us to Matthew 27, which is the passage that we heard earlier. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there or you can just follow along with me. I'd love to just look at a few pieces of that. And I'd love to just focus on the way that, yeah, Jesus had such a deep journey of suffering. But as Jared framed for us so nicely earlier in this service, that he experienced so much of that alone. And there's a few pieces from this passage that I want to highlight that point that out in the ways that Jesus experienced aloneness. And first is a physical sense of being alone. We see in Matthew 27, verses 27 and 28, then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And I think sometimes we skip over that quick little part that says that they stripped him because quickly it transitions to the, that they robed him and then they mocked him and put thorns on his head. But the reality is, is that Jesus was stripped bare. Jesus was stripped bare in front of the onlookers, in front of his friends and his family and uh, the people that mocked him and judged him. He was left on the most physical level. He was degraded and dehumanized and made bare in every sense of the word. He was alone in the most raw of ways. He was physically vulnerably raw and he was exposed. And there's this juxtaposition as we look at all of the accounts of Jesus' uh, journey to the cross. 
in this, this contrast of him being surrounded by so many people and yet in all of his suffering doing that alone. And physically we see this with Jesus being abused and stripped and exposed vulnerably and raw. On an emotional level, this passage goes on to keep talking about how Jesus was mocked from all sides. And this little portion that Quincy read for us earlier is peppered with the accounts of the people from all sides that were mocking Jesus. We have the onlookers, verses 31, 32, 41, 42. We have the crowd. The crowd of people who likely had been journeying with Jesus through his parade to this point of suffering and crucifixion. And a mob mentality had started to form. The crowd was, I'm sure, a mix of people, both those who had followed Jesus and adored him and, and uh, stuck to his teaching and those that doubted him and questioned him and were against him. And yet the overwhelming words coming from the crowd were words of mockery. And then you have the soldiers, the ones that represent the state, using their power to strip Jesus down with their words, to mock him and abuse him on an emotional level. And then we have the religion, the same religion that Jesus came to shut down. We have the chief priests mocking Jesus, taunting him, stripping down his identity. On an emotional level, Jesus was again exposed in front of all sorts of people and yet so very alone, being taunted and tortured and mocked. And the friends, the ones that claimed that they would be by him this, in this whole journey, not only were they not an appropriate six feet safe distance away, they were actually nowhere to be seen. And emotionally, Jesus was alone in his suffering. And then spiritually, those verses, those last few verses that Quincy read, verses 45 and 46, these are the last words that Jesus said before he cried out after his death. And the words that Jesus says, verse 45, tell us, 46, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And see, those words, even in and of themselves, are words of utter aloneness. They paint a picture of absolute being forsaken and alone. But the reality of what Jesus was saying here, he was quoting a Psalm, Psalm 22. He was quoting words that would have been very familiar to those around him. The ears that were listening to him cry out, they would have recognized these words from that Psalm. These words come from a song of lament, a Psalm of lament. Words that often would have been used in seasons of grief, lament, they would have been spoken at a funeral. These are words of finality. And what's so interesting is that Jesus, the one who actually understands the purpose of his death and what is coming on the other side, Jesus is the one who speaks these words of finality. See, in this ultimate act of love that led him to the cross for us in partnership with the Father, he cries out words that would have been so identifiable to those in the crowd that would have been suffering and grieving and feeling a sense of aloneness. And yet Jesus says those words, and I think they ping for us too today, for those of us that are experiencing grief and lament and suffering and aloneness. Jesus has spoken these words that create space for us to sit in the unknown before the victory that comes and the hope of the resurrection on Sunday. And so even on a spiritual level, as Jesus suffered, he paints a picture of what it looks like to be alone using words that would have resonated so deeply with those that were in the crowd on the day. See, the whole of Jesus suffering, the whole journey that Jesus had to take, we see that he endured so much of it alone, even in the presence of so many people. And I've often asked the question, and perhaps you do too, as you sit on Good Friday, why did it have to go this way? Could there not have been any other way for humanity to be restored to God? Well, and we know Jesus actually asked this question himself as he sat in the garden on this journey where he said, if there is any other way, take this from me, but not my will, but yours be done. So why this, why, and if death, well, even if it has to be death, why did it have to be so utterly profound and horrific in the journey of suffering that Jesus took? And as we sit with that question, there's two passages that I just wanna to refer to that you can check on your own. The first comes from John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus is actually talking about his own death that is coming. And Jesus says, it is in my death and as I ascend that all men will be drawn to me. 
See, Jesus describes the purpose of his death is for the whole world to be able to be drawn to him. So there was a purpose for the way that Jesus needed to die. And Jesus knew that as he spoke of his upcoming journey to the cross. And then in Hebrews 2, we see it a few places. It talks about the death of Jesus happening so that he could experience death for all people and the suffering that Jesus experienced happening so that he could relate to all of the suffering of all people. See, the reason that the death and the life of Jesus had to look the way it did is because it enabled Jesus to fully enter into every single experience of our suffering, of our being alone, our moments of feeling so exposed and raw and vulnerable, often in the midst of so many people and yet so alone. The journey of suffering that Jesus took to the cross, being so alone was so that he could say, I've been there too. For every layer of a suffering or grief or lament or being utterly alone that we will ever experience and we will because we live in a broken world. The reality is that Jesus has gone before us and walked that and experienced that too. And so John 12 and Hebrews 2 paint a beautiful picture of the purpose of Jesus' death and ultimately his resurrection. And so therein lies the truth that maybe you need to hear today, that you actually are never fully alone. Jesus uttering those words on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me is a way that would have just resonated so deeply with the crowd that day. (laughs) Jesus uttering those words, it's so that we never actually have to. We will experience suffering on all levels, and don't we? Physically, emotionally, spiritually, we are there too so often. Physically, our bodies fail us, and there is illness, and there's brokenness, and there is abuse, and there's a vulnerable, raw exposure that many of us have experienced at times. Emotionally, so much emotional suffering causes us to have to experience that alone, whether that's processing mental health journeys whether that really is perhaps having experience of the mob mentality against you, being misunderstood, being mocked, being isolated, being excluded. Maybe you're just experiencing a brokenness in your spirit, but on an emotional level, we suffer so often alone. And spiritually, there's so often perhaps we find ourselves crying out saying, okay, God, where are you? My God, my God, you've left me. I've never known you. We have those experiences of spiritual silence, of feeling absolutely alone. Or maybe you're experiencing as you as you uh, join in with us today saying, I actually don't even know if God is real. This Jesus that you talk about this story, I tuned in because it's a tradition. It's, it's the Easter weekend. It's Good Friday, but I don't even know if I buy it. So therefore, doesn't that write me off? Doesn't that exclude me? And, and no, it doesn't. <laughs> because even in your doubt, even in your questioning, Jesus says, I have created space for that too. All of it, all of what we experience, Jesus says, I have walked that road too. And so we are left with this beautiful truth that we are never fully alone. And perhaps today, more than ever, there is just this unique sense of where we find ourselves in the midst of a global pandemic. If ever there were a time for loneliness to prevail, it is now. And I know so many are actually alone in a way that they never have been. We are in a unique time in history and perhaps today Good Friday holds more significance for you than it ever has before. Hear me say again the truth that Jesus says, I have experienced that too and I am with you. In the midst of this pandemic, I know there's been so many pieces for our our entire world to experience, so many pieces that we are of unknown uncertainty, fear, anxiety. There's also been some moments of humor. There's memes going around left, right, and center. I know so many of us do have extra time on our hands and we maybe spend that on social media. And there's this one meme, it makes me chuckle, but it also causes such an introspective question. And perhaps you've seen it too. Just the the poster going around the meme that says, if the one thing I've really learned about myself in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of this lockdown or quarantine, is that my top three hobbies were going out to eat at restaurants, shopping at non-essential stores and touching my face. And while that maybe makes us chuckle, I want to turn that and say, but actually though, in this time that we find ourselves of uncertainty, in this time of uh, unprecedented being alone, what has this exposed in you? 
We're experiencing pressure on all sides. And often when there's pressure or crisis or stress, it reveals more of who we truly are and the things that we maybe would use to fill the void and, and distract from staring into those things have in essence been taken away from us for a season. What are the things about yourself that you're learning in the midst of this? Perhaps I'm not actually as connected as I thought I was. Huh, I am, I'm more burned out than I realized. I don't have very much margin. I can't do this for much longer. My loved one is sick and I'm more scared than I ever thought I would be. I'm so alone. I, I've never been so anxious or perhaps judgmental or self-protective or whatever weakness that you're aware of. I've never been so aware of it before. This time has created a space for us to sit, perhaps in more loneliness. And as we look at this idea of what this means for Good Friday, there's this concept out there of holding space. This isn't a new concept. This has been around for centuries. And in this midst of this pandemic, it's something I've heard talked about a bit of holding space. It really just is the practice of being with, being present, whether that's holding space for someone else or whether that's holding space for yourself, creating space to listen, uh, introspect, learn more, just be present. And this is something we need to do for one another. But Good Friday, it's also about holding space to sit in the lament of all that Jesus experienced in his journey of suffering to the cross and to sit in the lament of all the ways our world is broken. And perhaps for you today, that's sitting in the lament or the grief of just seeing what is broken in your own life today, experiencing that loneliness. Holding space is giving permission to sit with it, to feel it, and to allow that to be a part of your journey and reality. And so do that today. Find ways on Good Friday to hold space. If it's just going back over the passages that were shared this morning, do that. Circle words that stick out to you. Underline stuff that doesn't make sense. Exclamation mark the stuff that leaves you horrified at what Jesus went through. Perhaps it's writing your own lament. Take a pen to paper and just start writing and cry out to God all of the ways that this world is broken, that you feel lonely and that you suffer. In whatever way you need to experience holding space today, be reminded of the truth that you don't do it alone. Jesus is with you in that. And so wherever you find yourself today and whatever you find yourself experiencing today or just in the season of life that's weird and disorienting, Jesus says, I experience that too. And I sit with you. I cry with you. I grieve with you. I cry out with you. I'm exposed with you. All of it. I do it with you. And as we move into a time of communion, we're going to take communion together as a community this morning. And in the Luke account of Jesus' journey to the cross, uh, he experiences the Last Supper with his disciples and he sits with them. And there's this beautiful verse, Luke 22, 15 and 16. And this is Jesus talking. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Jesus was at this Last Supper participating in, in a Jewish tradition that was a symbol of memory for them, a symbol of the freedom that God brought to them. And Jesus takes this tradition and turns it in a, into a beautiful symbol of the coming new covenant. See, it says he's so eager to experience this with the ones that he loves because he knows that he's about to embark on the journey of suffering that ultimately will change everything. And he tells his disciples that from this point on, this tradition will be used to remember the death and the life of him. And he does. He points to the hope that's coming that one day all will be restored and fulfilled. They weren't there yet and neither are we. But in the meantime, hold space. And know that I am with you in all of it. And this is why my death is significant. And so as we take communion today, we look at this beautiful example of what Jesus laid out for his disciples. And we see that what he has actually done is he is creating a way for them to hold space. To hold space in the middle of his death and what's yet to come in his resurrection a few days later. But also for us in the midst of being in a world that is still broken and holds so much of that suffering and loneliness. 
And taking communion is an act of saying we hold space, we remember what he did so that actually we never, ever have to be alone in it. And it's a way for us to remember the significance of what Jesus did and how ultimately that transforms our lives. Jesus modeled this way and his followers ever since then have been taking part in the sacrament. And so that's what we're about to do now. We've invited you to prepare your own communion elements, whatever those may be. And I will take just a few moments now. If you need to still go grab those or just prepare them, let's take a moment of pause and grab our elements together. And then we will partake in communion. And so as we gather back together, holding whatever elements you may find in whatever context you find yourself, know that you are coming to the table with a community of believers. And oh, my friends, this is one of the most significant things we get to do together. It looks different today. And for those sitting maybe totally alone in whatever space you find yourself, I see you. And I know there might be some uh, grief with that. But as you partake, my prayer is that you feel the communion of other believers and of this family and ultimately that Jesus is with you. If you're with us today and you're still exploring who Jesus is, maybe you identified with that sense of, yeah, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm checking this out. I don't know what this means. I hope the truth you've heard today is that he is so very present in wherever you find yourself. And this is an instruction that he gives his followers. And so you're welcome to observe. There's no pressure for anyone to partake as we are about to, as I lead us through this. There's also permission to fully step into that space and participate and say, Jesus, I acknowledge that your death and life have significance and I am figuring that out. Kids that are with us, we say, hi, we're so glad that you're with us. What a special time to be together as family. And we trust that as a family, you'll talk about what this means. Kids, I hope you ask your parents lots of questions about what this looks like and what it is. And they'll lead you through if this is something you should do together as a family, or if you want to listen and learn and watch as we as a church participate in communion together. And so in 1 Corinthians 11, this is the passage that comes after Jesus has uh, died and been resurrected. And, and later, as Paul instructs followers to do what we're about to do in the Lord's Supper. And so I'll read it for us and then we'll partake the bread and the juice in whatever form you find yourself. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 25 say, For this from the Lord, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so I'll invite us now to take your bread, to take what peace you have, and be reminded of the words of Jesus and say, He's held space for us to sit on this Good Friday and whatever emotions we find ourselves in, though you're permitted to feel that and know that. And he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take our bread together. And in the same way, after supper, Jesus held the cup before his disciples and we do the same with whatever you might have. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take our cup together.
What a beautiful moment to sit in together and to be together on this Good Friday. I'm going to pray and then we'll continue with some more singing together. Will you pray with me? Hmm. Jesus, thank you that you are present with us. Wherever we find ourselves today, you are there. May we know that truth even more significantly today in a more real, in a more deep way. Jesus, I pray for people who would identify so deeply on this moment with the suffering that you experience, the physical, the emotional, the mental, the spiritual. And you did so much of that alone as people stood by, put their hands up and denied even knowing you. And part of why you did that was so that you can sit with each one of us and say, I am with you and I have experienced that too. May we know that truth today and may that bring a sense of comfort and a sense of understanding of who we are in you. We thank you for your journey to the cross and we thank you that that is not the end of the story and that the hope is coming. And we hold space for that this weekend. Help us to understand more and more about what you did, how that changes our lives forever. We pray this in your name, amen. Hi, I'm Brexy. Thanks for tracking with the Meeting House teaching. If you wanna see more videos by us, just click right here. If you wanna see what our youth and our kids are learning, you click here. And if you wanna be notified anytime we post a new video to make sure you don't miss a teaching, then you subscribe by clicking right here. Thanks again for tracking with us.